Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Max on Booth Day 3. I'm here with Nick Denboer. Denboer. Boer. Denboer. And uh, things are going to get a little bit weird. So Nick is also known as AKA Smearballs, and he does a number of very interesting, uh, dynamic, integrated, mixed reality, just fun all around. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great, man. And that, that booth models by uh, Matthias oh, here, yeah, actually. Oh. He collab I collaborated uh, with him on really? it. I'm going to drag you into this, man. Oh. I'm dragging you into this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> smear balls. Hey, everybody. Thank you, thank you. I'm just going to play that on a loop because Mike just got here, and I think it makes him uncomfortable, so I'm going to leave that out. But yeah, my name is Nick Dembor. I'm, uh, I'd like to thank Maxon for having me here, and I'm also kind of like winging it with the software. I'm self-taught, so I, I learned almost everything from some of the other presenters, so it's pretty awesome to be on the stage with these other guys. And uh, I want to give a shout out to everybody watching at home. It's pretty cool that it's streaming. So I'm going to play my reel, just so you kind of know where I'm coming from here. Do, do, do. Oh, I need audio. Hey, Matt. Oh. oh, there we go. Cool. disturbing. Alright. So yeah, a bunch of weird, gross stuff in there. But uh, somehow people still hire me, so that's cool. So I do a lot. I started out as like an After Effects guy doing a lot of 2D stuff as a remix artist on YouTube like pop culture stuff, remixing infomercials and stuff like that. And that later kind of led to a job at uh, as a bit creator on Conan. So I did that for a bunch of years. And that's where I really kind of sharpened my pencil doing pitching a video like almost every day for years. So I kind of like just got used to doing stupid long days. And then Cinema 4D kind of trickled into my workflow more and more, just kind of souping up my After Effects projects with 3D objects. And then later, it's kind of the other way around now. Like I do mostly cinema and soup up my cinema projects with After Effects. So uh, I'm going to go through some of my projects. Um, I made these. It was in my reel, but I'm going to show you these little dancing animals I made for Dead Mouse. It was for a uh, uh, live tour visual package that we did. So he's got this crazy 3D cube, and we map these things on, on his uh, live set. So I did the heads in uh, of those animals in Cinema 4D and the bodies in After Effects. So. I'm just going to quickly 
show you that head, because it's super simple. Oh, that's another project, sorry. Do, 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 do. Here it is. So I just, it's just his regular head. I threw some teeth in there and uh, put an IK chain with the tongue. So we've got a little floppy tongue going on. And so I just animated that, exported it with an alpha channel, and put it on my uh, animals that I had pre-animated in After Effects. So I'm just going to tell this little story of how I've been working with Deadmau5. So I, after, after we had a successful run with that visuals package, I bought a new camera and did a little uh, camera tracking test in Cinema 4D of my own studio in Toronto. And I made this little walking pan shot with a bunch of weird stuff in front of my studio. And uh, so I took this video and I sent it to Joel, to Deadmau5, and I was like, hey, man, we should do this. Uh, kind of a thing at your mansion and make something crazy because he's got this crazy property with all these like I don't know crazy cars and a pool so he was down he was like I love it let's do it so we went, I went to his place and shot this music video with really n no actors no storyboard no plan no no one else involved really we just went and shot a bunch of empty plates at his house and uh, he's a, he's also a pretty good drone pilot so he did this one continuous drone shot up his driveway which I'm going to show you now the final result um, I guess we don't have audio. Do we have audio, Matt? Inside my head, there's a little place left for you. What do you know? What do you know? So it's all kind of downhill from there, but <laughs> anyway, that uh, so that intro shot was uh, thank you very much by the way. That intro shot took me about three weeks solid, and uh, it was insane because we shot it all in 4K and I actually rendered it all in 4K, which was probably excessive because everyone probably watches it on their phone. But uh, so it posed a lot of problems. I needed to figure out how to comp this without, and if there was any changes, I uh, wouldn't have to render the entire thing again. So I actually broke this thing into a whole bunch of different Cinema 4D projects. Like this intro right up until the gate going down is one project, the naked weird clown dude and the car is another project, the tentacles are another one, the shark, the, it's a, I think 12 different projects going all the way up. And this is, I broke it up for a few reasons because there's so many polygons in this shot that it wouldn't even load into the VRAM in my, uh, <laughs> in my card because I use Octane. So I don't know, it was millions and millions of polys, so I didn't optimize this scene at all. So I just broke it up, but it, it was handy because I could then uh, comp separately and swap things out and comp later as there were changes. And uh, also the lighting changed from the driveway all the way down to the end here. So I shot, uh, I have a Ricoh Theta camera and I shot HDRIs all up the driveway. I think I used two or three different ones up the driveway, one by the house to get different uh, lighting situations nailed down. So I'm going to open up one of these projects and give you a little behind the scenes here. Uh, so here's the intro. And you can see that I did a camera solve all the way from the beginning, the full, I think it's uh, almost 1100 frames. And uh, you can see the camera panning up the scene and uh, revealing the texture as it goes. So this is a projection map texture on the driveway. You can see all my track points there. So I, I took all these track points, and maybe there's an easier way to do this, but to make my ground plane, I couldn't use, there's a kind of re reconstruction tool in uh, the new version of Cinema 4D that actually makes a geometry for you, and that uh, wouldn't work on such a crazy huge shot. So I actually took the polygon pen tool and snapped it, and I drew polygons between all these track points meticulously. And uh, if somebody in the crowd here might know an easier way to do this, I'm like, it took hours. And then I smoothed it out, uh, subdivided it, and kind of created this ground plane. And it stuck pretty well. Everything kind of locked in. And, uh, and it worked great. So that was kind of, I'm going to go through a little tracking demo as well. Actually, I'll do that right now. 
Uh, 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 uh. So uh, if you open up a new motion tracker and go to footage, I'm going to load in a little shot. I did actually in another Dead Mouse video. Um, mm -mm -mm. Sorry, the double click is like, I got to do it like lightning fast on this machine. It's slowing me down here. Uh, there, I'm going to load this church shot. So I'm going to crank up the resampling actually all the way. So I'll just say it's kind of a gross church downtown Toronto. There's kind of a, a lot of drug use there. I think there's a pill bottle and some puke and garbage. I was doing a, trying to find like gross places in Toronto for this music video because it had that kind of aesthetic. So that's why I shot this. Um, it's my style. So yeah, so this is a pretty, there's actually quite a bit of motion in this shot. I'm just kind of analyzing it here. So uh, when you go to the 2D tracking tab and go to your options, the default pattern size I find is a little bit small and set for like less motion or like a pan shot or something a little simpler. So I usually double these numbers and or thereabouts. And this actually, what this does is your default pattern size. So it's, a, it's an area of pixels that tries to recognize a pattern. And then the search size uh, around it, which like the pattern stays within. So if you up those, you've got a bigger range that you can uh, track with so that you get more accurate tracks. Um, so I'm going to go back to my 2D tracking panel and make like 500 of these tracks and create auto tracks. Now, I notice with this footage on the right, we've got this chain link fence and that's going to confuse things because the pixels are really thin there and it's not going to know what's behind the fence and what, what is the fence. So I go in and delete these and uh, use your right mouse button and circle this and press backspace, delete them. Now, I would normally, if I was doing this not in a tutorial situation where there's time constraints, I would go around and grab tracks that weren't good and in good positions and put them where I want them to be because I know I'm going to want to know these coordinates. So I would move these all around meticulously and do like a, you know, get like good spots that are going to give me good tracks and, and give me good planes. So I'm going to go ahead and auto track this just because we're on a time constraint here. And uh, yeah, so actually, oh, that went really fast, actually. OK, so oh, that didn't work well at all. OK, Maybe I have to go back to my options and drop this. Oh, it's because I had the search size at 10. That's why. OK, sorry about that, guys. I'm going to do that again. Free all tracks. And Delete these guys. Let that go. And this is kind of an ideal shot for this with all the sh sharp, flat geometry. It's, it's going to work pretty well. So you see all these tracks are sticking really well, some of them all the way through, which is nice. So I usually go, I'm going to go every 50 frames and kind of repeat that step. And again, delete these problematic frames or tracker trailer. And I, I'm also going to delete these far ones because they're in kind of blurry footage and it, they're on trees, which the wind could be moving and they can be problematic as well. All right. And two more times. Oh. Delete these. I'm going to do one more at the end. OK, so now we have like quite a few track points throughout the entire length of the track, which is looking pretty nice. If I was doing this separately, I might do some more and do some manual tracks. You can right click and create a user track and track that as well to get specific points where you want and you can and dial them in. but. Just for speed purposes, I'm going to keep rolling here. So I, we have all these tracks. We're ready to do the 3D camera solve. And I'm just going to run the 3D solver and leave all the settings as they are. And that's going to take a little while. So I'll just show you a couple shots that I have tracked. Um, this is, so this is actually fr from the music video I did. I put this like weird headless dude in here and did a reverse shot of him bouncing his head on the ground and some weird alien worm creatures. So 
It worked really well in that shot. And I'm going to show you how to light it and everything as well in a minute. And I like to do a lot of like weird Mixamo hacking and like take, uh, Mixamo is a uh, motion tracking software by Adobe and I like to cut these bodies apart and make weird Frankenstein things. So this is another little weird dog guy. He was in the earlier video too, but he's kind of strutting his stuff. So I like to do that kind of stuff on Instagram. And this was also from that dead mouse video with the alien worms. I kind of use the same texture and so this was just a regular Mixamo body. I kind of deleted all the motion uh, aside from the spine and parented these arms with IKs to flop around while he's dancing. And uh, if I have time at the end, I'm going to crack that project open so you can kind of see the hierarchy. Um, okay, our 3D solve is finished over here. So now if we drop this down and let me get out of my camera, you can see it created all these track points. The green ones are more accurate and the pink ones are less accurate so you can see we've got a nice ground plane there and the stairs and everything like that so it worked out really well so the next step is to you can see how it was on this weird angle it made the ground plane all crooked so we need to correct that and with that we go into the motion tracker go to our constraints tab and click on our motion tracker so the first one I'm going to do is create a position constraint and that's going to center the project on a certain one of these points. So I'm going to pick this one right here because it's a nice center point. I'm going to do a planar constraint and which sets the ground plane. So I think these pieces of paper are nice high contrast. I'm going to pick some of those and maybe that guy there. And then you check this out. You can kind of see that you've got some pretty confident tracks here. They're nice and bright green. Maybe not that middle one, but I'm going to see how it works anyway. It's on the y-axis. And you can actually see right here, this is my horizon line. So it's got a pretty nice horizon where it needs to be. So that looked at, like it worked out pretty well. Next, I'm going to create a vector constraint. And that is going to set an axis. You can do it on any x, y, or z. Um, I'm going to use those two points. And now it's where you also set the scale. So I'm going to set the axis to x, because I'm going left to right there. And then I'm going to drop in a just a generic figure. So it looks like my scale's not bad off the bat, but it's, he's probably a little bit on the small side, I think. Just going to move him forward a bit. And uh, so in your uh, ta uh, tab here, you can go to known for your length, and you can input something. Ideally, when you shoot, you would measure something. So you had the accurate measurement of something in your scene to reference, but I didn't do that. So we're going to take a guess at like 200 centimeters. And that's looking pretty decent. So we've got a pretty good scale there. And our guy is in there. So let's say you went on uh, Beeple's uh, Dropbox and stole a scan of him dancing. <laughs> and uh, you want to put him in your scene. So I'm just going to copy that. Um, I'll play it first. You can check it out. It's got some good moves. It's cool. Uh, oops. Just going to name that Mike. And I'm just going to save this for a second. And now I'm going to drop this in our scene. Oh, and he's small. His scale's a little off. He's not that short in real life, but I think I made a conversion from inches to centimeters that screwed me up. So I'm just going to spin him around a little bit. Now we also, uh, Motion Tracker has a, I'm gonna, just going to scale him up rather than scale my scene because he's not actually to scale. But, oh, whoops. And uh, so th to create our ground plane, I mean, I could just throw a plane in there and uh, and use that. And you can see even just kind of like rotating it around, you see where it intersects with all our tracking points. So that's kind of a good way if your scene's totally flat to get a half decent uh, shadow catcher for your, for your plane. I use that on, on a lot of scenes, but if you've got something a little more organic, it's, uh, it's not gonna work out so well. So built into the motion tracker is a reconstruction tab, and it's got some more options I'm not gonna go into right now, but I'm just gonna generate a mesh quick so we can see what that looks like. And it's going to come in like pretty noisy. It's, it's kind of like a photogrammetry technique where it's not totally perfect, but it's, uh, it gives you an excellent uh, geometry that, to match to. 
and, uh, and gives you a good reference point that you can kind of smooth out. Um, just takes a second here. And now I also shot HDRIs for uh, all of the scenes in this video too. So I took my 360 cam, shot at uh, 12 or 13 different exposures and merged them in, in uh, Photoshop and created an uh, HDRI for this scene. So I don't know if I can do anything while this is generating a mesh, but yeah, I can. So I'm just gonna add a, I'm so used to using the Grayscale Gorilla HDRI link, I went to that as a default. Um, so I'm gonna go to my environment tag and add my HDRI file. Okay, so there it's done our geometry. So you can see it's like a really all over the place geometry. And if you go into your motion tracker uh, tab and go to your footage, create a background object, and it'll actually create the texture of uh, uh, your video in the background. And I can also add that to my scene mesh, and it's going to project that onto the scene mesh. So, like I said, it's super noisy, but you've got like, I'm gonna zoom out of here. You've got a really good, you know, reference mesh. If you wanna build the stairs, or uh, you know, anything with cubes, it'll, it'll work really well. So, for lighting this, here, I'm gonna move, move the mic up a little bit here. Um, so, lighting-wise, if I go into Octane, um, you can see where we're lit up. So our, my uh, Octane sky is a little bit bright here. I'm going to turn that down. And actually, I don't know why that's so bright. It wasn't in the test before, but I'm going to load it up one more time. Um, and our texture doesn't work on the scene mesh, so I need to convert that to a cinema for, or to an octane texture. Convert the material, and go into the animation tab and set my frame length to, and frame rate to 30. And now I can drop that onto my scene mesh. And frontal projection doesn't work in uh, Octane, so you need to use camera projection. So in your uh, projection tab, you go to camera mapping, drag your solved camera into here, and use this calculate button. And I don't know why that worked. I guess you can't do that in, in this tab with an Octane texture. So when you go to your output settings, you can see your film aspect here, 1.778. I'm going to copy that and stick it in here and it'll give me an accurate projection of the tab. Now my material is really bright because of the HDRI as well, so I would turn this power down on my HDRI to point, or on my uh, projected texture to 0.5. And I'm gonna turn this power way down to like 0.2. And 0.1. Now you can see the um, 0.25 here. Oh, sorry, sloppy fingers. Now you can see my HDRI is not really lined up here either, so you can kind of rotate till you've got the, oh, it actually was, the church door is like on there. And uh, that's kind of like basic lighting setup. I think actually something's wrong right now with my HDRI because it's not supposed to be so bright and I don't know what's happening, but basically you want to line up your tonal values and I do co color correction and post. You can go into your camera, um, uh, sorry, your Octane uh, camera tag and, you, and go into a camera imager and, and change your white balance to uh, alter the color and give it more of a warmer hue. Let me crank that up even more. So you can kind of do some corrections so you don't have to do as much in, in post when you composite it later. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna move on to another project. That's your basic uh, workflow for doing motion tracking and adding a character in there. Oh, I'm gonna just turn off my scene mesh. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just open another project here, the clown car. It's back to the dead mouse video. Um, doo, doo, doo. So here we have this uh, weird naked clown dude crawling down the driveway, and he's from uh, 1024.com, it's ten24.info rather. And they sell these amazing like 3D scans of people that are fairly reasonably priced. So I buy a lot of models off of that. 
And uh, so I used a naked dude off of that. And I actually had, that was one of the few notes I got on this uh, video. It was almost no changes, but you could kind of see his genitals in one shot a little bit. So I had to put a thong on him. So that's why he's wearing that weird thong. Because they're like, you have to blur it out. And I'm like, it's going to look stupid to have like pixelated blur stuff. So I got away with just putting a thong on that dude, which is cool. And uh, there's a little dog over here who I didn't really have the time to animate, so I, or rig rather. And he was also super high poly, so I just put a bunch of funny bend deformers on him, so he's just kind of like wiggling his legs all weird. And there's a lot you can do with uh, bend deformers. I'm going to go into that later with super high poly models, because they bend these 7 million poly models with no problem at all. So I like to kind of do funny stuff with that. Um, but what I want to show you is this car. Um, so it ha this terrain isn't flat, and I uh, was ran into a problem with keyframing it without the wheels intersecting with the ground plane. So um, I actually put motors on this car, which is here somewhere. Yes. Yeah, so I've got these two motors, one on each uh, wheel. And when you watch it simulate, there's dynamics tabs on the wheels and a collider tab on the on the ground plane, and it just drops in. And I just got it going real slow, and I just kept trial and error timing it so that it would chase the clown. And the clown's keyframes are going to kick in and start crawling while it uh, follows it. So there's no animation, no keyframes. It's just rolling on that, on that uh, plane. So I'm going to just demonstrate how that's done. I've got this project with these four tires already set up. And the first step that you have to do is go to uh, your dynamics and make a connector. Whoa. So you parent the connect. Oh, actually, before I do that, sorry, order of operations here. I'm going to make a little car body so it has something to attach to. So I'm just going to use a cube because it's easy. And put it something like that. A bit higher. So this connector, you've got these options in the type. I'm going to use wheel suspension. And I'm going to just zero out the coordinates using the PSR zero button, which you can also find by pressing Shift C and type PSR. I just have it in my uh, work pane here, so it's easier. So then you have to put the object A, you use the car body, the cube. I'm just going to label that because it's easier to remember. And then the second object, object B, is the tire itself. Drop that in there. Now I'm just going to copy that and do the same thing for all four tires and replace the tire in each one. Um. Okay. So these are labeled front right, rear right, rear left, or front, yeah, front left, front right, rear right, and rear left. So now we've got all four, and I have to zero them all out so they're all on their corresponding tire. Now I have to add two motors. So we go to simulate dynamics motor. And in the motor, we do the opposite. We put the car body in object B, and we put the tire we want in object A. So I'm going to use front left and front right on these. I'm going to make a second motor and use the front right. So now we have two motors on those car tires. And now I need to add some uh, rigid body dynamics. So I'm going to put in a ground plane first. I'm just going to drop it a little below so that it's not intersecting with the tires or anything. And I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. And on the plane, I'm going to put a uh, collider body. And on the wheels, I need a rigid body tag. Um, so I'm going to copy this four times by holding Control. And now I'm going to select all four of them. And for this, I want to turn the uh, friction way up because we want to get traction on the ground. So I'm, I'm going to go to like 90, let's say. And we don't really need much bounce, if any. So I'm going to turn that down. I'm also going to turn the friction up on the ground plane. And I need to, I think that's all the steps. Let's cross our fingers because it's easy to screw this up in a lot of steps. And I might have totally, totally messed this up. No, what's happening? Motor. I'm going to turn up my torque to 90. And oh, you know what? Oh, it's spinning, but it's not moving. What's going on? 
This is, I don't know. I totally messed something up. No traction on the ground. Maybe my friction's way off. Oh my god. I don't know, guys. I just worked before. How embarrassing. Anyway, I did something wrong, and I'm not sure what it is. But I'm going to keep moving on, unless one of my motors is in front left, front right. Yeah. Oh my god. I need, I need Chris Schmidt up here. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick look here and check. All right, I'm going to move on, I think, because... Let me see. Oh, I'm going to turn the shape to static mesh to see if that helps. No. Wow. Okay, guys. Let's forget I even showed you this, because I'm going to keep moving here, because I'm not going to troubleshoot this for my entire project. So uh, I'm going to go into the uh, tank project. We'll chalk that up to uh, inexperience and add to my imposter syndrome up here. Uh, anyway, so I, I built this tank, which was made from a uh, just a really bad 3D model. So I had to soup it up quite a bit. I made this tread from uh, scratch uh, using probably one of the other presenters' tutorials as well, and uh, made this cool track. And then uh, the I added all these little rivets just to give it some cool detail. And um, yeah, it was. It modeled after Dead Mouse's cars, actually, because he's got, uh, he had a Lamborghini and a Ferrari with this same kind of pattern. So I thought I'd make a cool tank with the same kind of thing. So I'm just going to go back to the video so you can see this emitter. Uh, 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 uh. It is. So I did a really simple. Oh. So yeah, just these uh, cubes that emitted out of the end of the tank. And I didn't use X particles or anything like this. It was just like straight up uh, regular emitter. It's really easy to do, so I'm just going to show it real quick. Um, just going to do a new project. Go to simulate and uh, particles. Just make a regular emitter. And I'm just going to shrink it way down. And make my cube particle which is just going to be like six centimeters diameter. And you make that a child of the emitter. And I'm going to add a rigid body dynamics tab to the cube. Again, I'm going to put a floor, raise up my emitter. So we've got something for the particles to bounce off of. And I'm going to put a collider body tag on the floor. And now if we play it back, oh, I need to go to show particles one second, show objects. So here we just see these particles go out and they all start falling down. So now I want to give it a little bit more speed. So I'm going to put that up to 60, shoot it out. And we get this nice kind of bouncing. Now, also, we want to get some variation in the rotation. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of rotation. The variation's already put up to 100, but I need to give it something to multiply by. So I'm going to turn that up a bit. And there we got a nice little spray of cubes. So I'm going to now, I'm just going to make my emitter a little bit smaller. So I'm going to pull that out, shrink it down, put it back in there. So. Now it's smaller, so we're getting a bit of a different action out of that. OK, so now I'm just going to like, I have this sequence of uh, myself walking around. Uh, let me just open it up. Um, Nick, catwalk. So. This is a really cool sequence, just like that shot of Mike. I can also be self-deprecating here and make fun of myself. So, so now if I want to make these cubes, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this the other way around. Take my emitter and copy it into here. So 
I'm going to open my hierarchy and find my head. Take my emitter and drop it into my head bone, my head joint. Go to my coordinates and zero out all my coordinates. Now that's going to be backwards, so I'm going to spin this emitter around 180 degrees, and point it up a bit, and push it until I can see it in my mouth. And now I'm going to be able to walk and hopefully projectile vomit these cubes. Yeah, I need to throw up my uh, speed a little bit so this really gets humming. So I'm going to turn that up to 90. And now we're spraying some cubes. I need to avoid my shirt. Give it even more. I'm just going to give it a little texture too so you can see it better. And give it some color. Mm. They're bloody cubes. It's terrible. And again, you can put your ground plane in with a... I'm like, no one else is going to like find this useful except for me. If you need someone to pee cubes, that's how you do it. Um, I'm going to put a collider body on the floor again. And boom, they're going to bounce around. So that's a fun one. Really useful. Um, OK, so I think I'm going to move off of the dead mouse stuff for a second and go into Kentucky Fried Chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken has been my main squeeze for a while. I've been doing a lot of projects for them. And uh, about a year and a bit ago, I think it was December 2017, they, uh, the ad agency, Wyden and Kennedy, came to me and they wanted to make this uh, meditation system for chicken pot pies. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but it was, uh, it was supposed to be a late night slot on TV. That was like an infomercial slot where you, I guess stoners could watch this thing and it's uh, psychedelic chicken pot pie stuff. So it's going to play a chunk of it. It's a really long. We actually, it was an insane turnaround. We had something like 13 days to do 35 minutes of content. So I got this team together and we made one nine minute kind of hero video and then a whole bunch of shorter five minute little psychedelic things for people to trip out on. So. Just gonna play a little chunk of it here, but the time was a crazy, crazy thing with this video. Imagine that wolf surrounding you and relax. So this was all done in Cinema 4D. We now take a deep breath. Sculpted the pie and the sporks. Inhale the delicious. This was done by my good friend Octane Jesus here, David Arya. He made these amazing the space shots. World beneath the crust. crust. Imagine the peas, the carrots, the potatoes. Imagine the tender, juicy morsels of chicken. Now take your spork. Feel the weight of your spork. Imagine your spork as a spoon. Now imagine your spork as a fork. Now feel them coming together to become your spork. Imagine that your spork is an extension of your hand. Can you feel it? Good. Now hold your spork above the pot pie. Chicken, chicken, pot pie. And dive in. Feel the steam escape from the crust. Anyway, Let this goes on and on. It's really so long, I gotta cut it off at some point it. here. So <laughs> it was a cool project. So thank you very much. So it was a cool project, but like I said, it was insane time constraints. So luckily, there was enough of my talented freelancer friends to help out and, uh, and make that thing happen. I kind of, in retrospect, I don't even know how we did all of that in 13 days, but it happened. Um, so I'm just going to show you one of the projects that I did in that, which uh, 
was these hand spork things. So I, again, I bought these models off of 1024.info, and they're crazy high poly. Like they are, I don't know, seven million polygons or something. That's the density of the mesh. So we're on these time constraints. I didn't know how to retop. Is that me? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I didn't know how to retopologize this stuff, and uh, again, I used my magic bend deformer trick because these bend deformers on the arms can just bend this stuff with such ease. And it was funny for it said we, when you feel the weight of the spork and it just like flops down. It was funnier than actually animating it. So it, it worked out for the best. And uh, yeah, that's all we kind of did. We used bend deformers on this one. Same thing with the spork and the fork. These just have different visibility keyframes to turn them on and off, but they're just overlapping so that when the transition happens, it swaps out the visibility. And uh, yeah, this one worked out really well. I'll show you the other hand. Yeah, uh, let me see here. The spoon deformer, same thing. All it is is a bend deformer where I'm uh, keyframing the angle and, and the bend to have them like swoop up. And the sound effects did a lot for that part too. And now the other, oh, the other hand was a little bit more complicated. I actually did rig this hand, and you can see it is completely not anatomically correct. I only used two bones on each finger, but I, I just wanted it to have like some subtle uh, you know, finger motion, so I'm like all about saving time when you only have a few days. Um, so this one is done with a mesh deformer. So I created this uh, low poly hand mesh just by using... Um, circle splines and multiplying them and just kind of, I just built it and it didn't take too long. You can see it's not beautiful, but I just needed something to drive the animation of the hand because rigging and weighting a uh, several million poly model uh, that are all triangle polys is not gonna happen. So you can see this is my proxy mesh, which is the cage. And it, uh, you put the mesh deformer on the high res hand and drop your cage into here and in your advanced tab, you have to set the accuracy or set the uh, external to surface area, which kind of snaps the high poly mesh to the closest um, surface area poly on the on the cage. And now you can see if I go into the and then I'm sorry, then you press initialize and it locks it together. So I can take one of these pinky joints and bend it, and it's still a bit chunky, but it at least is animatable and you can kind of bend the fingers around. So it's a great way to take a super high poly mesh and drive it with a low poly proxy mesh. And I've done that a ton of times since. I made this weird kind of uh, donut thing, space donut, black hole. It's kind of folding in on itself. And again, that donut model was, I don't know how many millions of polygons, it was crazy. So I had to figure out how, I, I had the concept and wanted to do it, but I had to figure out how to oh, uh, make that animation happen. So I'm going to show you a little trick that I figured out, kind of proud of, because it took a while to think of it. So I made this sweep uh, NURB with uh, proxy mesh again. So you can see it's going to drive the donut. I don't know if my donut's not loaded here. Where's my donut? There it is. So I've got this uh, toroid, uh, toroid uh, shape that's driving this mesh. So it's pulling that donut in on itself and rotating. And I did that by animating a value in the sweep nerve, which I'm just going to make a new one quick to show you how it was done. And oh, is this, was this timer never turned on, or is it just at zero still? Because on my way over, let me know. Um, so I'm going to make two circles, and on the X set, oh sorry, set X, set X, and I'm going to make a sweep nerb, and, oh, wrong way. Oh, I think it's because I flipped one of these. You have to bear with me. I told you I'm kind of winging it here. I'm still figuring out this software after 10 years. So just put two circles in here, and I made this shape. 
and I was able to go into the details here. And in your rotation, when you alter this value, oh, I have to turn on my mesh so you can see what's going on. Um, when I highlight both of these and drag them up and down, it rotates that mesh. So that's how I was able to drive that mesh, because there's not really no other way to do it with just a geometric uh, uh, object like baked in without the spline. So that was a handy way to do that little trick if you ever want to make a black hole donut, which no one's probably going to do. So uh, now I'm going to open an old spice project that I did. I'm just going to show you. There's a bunch of it in my reel. Um, but I'm first going to show you. Old Spice hired, hired me to kind of remix five of their spots. So they had five existing uh, commercials that they wanted, like, banged into one, like, musical remix. So this is one of them. And just show you how kind of empty the scene was before I messed with it. So it's this. Oh, yeah. So it's this shot right here. And I'm going to show you what I turned it into with this one. So see, we've got this guy's head popping out with that rock. All I had was the 2D assets to work with, like the 2D video, so I wanted to make that head 3D. So I took the video and do, 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 do. here it is. So there's, I'm just going to actually hide my rock for a second here. So I exported a scene just in After Effects with just a cutout rock and this guy's head popping up that I rotoscoped and threw in there just so that I would have a reference of the height and so I could kind of match where I wanted to animate the rock here in Cinema 4D. But then I still needed to build the rock itself. So um, my solution was just to take a cube and kind of like line it up where the rock was, roughly. Sort of like that. And I'm going to fillet the edges of the rock so that we get a rounder shape and give it some more subdivisions so we've got a nice grid. My way over, uh, Matthias. <laughs> 70 minutes, cool. Cool. So there we got some decent geometry to that rock. And now we want to project this texture onto the rock so that we've got it uh, locked in. So I'm going to take this cube texture from my old rock, stick it on there. And we actually want to use um, camera mapping here. Drop our camera in and calculate. So now this is being projected on the rock. And you see I've got some overlap here where it's not quite connecting. I'm just going to tweak these values a little bit, get these get it just a little bit closer and give it a bit more rounding. Look like 43. Something like that. And actually, I want the corner of the rock to be about there. And of that. So I kind of got it like roughly in the right spot, but I need to do a bit of sculpting to get it uh, where it needs to be. So I'm going to make this layer editable, clicking there, and I'm going to go into my sculpt tab and select my cube object and use the grab tool. And now here you can resize your brush by holding down this, the middle button and I can start kind of pulling these shapes to be roughly where I need them to be and get that sort of rough shape. So that's pretty good. I'm not going to go crazy on it right now. But then I would also jump out of my camera because that's going to keep projecting onto my shape while I'm not in that camera. And I'm going to go to my pull tool and like see where the shadows are. I might want to do a little indent there. And I would probably give this more polygons as well. But I would hold down control and kind of push down. Actually, I am going to get more polygons just because I'm going to subdivide this a couple times. And then, yeah, hold down control. And you can kind of push some indents where the, where the shadows are and pull some uh, where the shadows aren't, where the highlights are, and just kind of give it some rough texture to give it a better shape. Uh, that's good enough for now. So I'm going to go into my startup layout and go back into my camera. So now that we have 
the rock, rock roughly uh, projection map. Now if I wanted to animate that, the texture's not going to stick and it's going to be not cool. So what we need to go is to the tags drop down menu and go to generate UV tag. Uh, 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 uh. Hang on, I got to get rid of my sculpt tab. My sculpt uh, tag, one second. So I'm going to right click on here and go to current state to object. Now I'm going to take this new cube. I'm actually going to delete that and go to my tags. Why isn't generate UV coordinates available? Oh man. Okay. Oh, I gotta click on the tag, that's it. There we go, click on the tag. Generate UV coordinates. Now, those are on there, and I can rotate the rock however I want. So, then I went in and just did some, uh, honestly, frame by frame animation and just like matched it up with my underneath layer to like get it up there and keyframed it all. And uh, yeah, worked out well. So I think that's my presentation. That's all I got. I'm going to work on that motor thing that I screwed up, and I'll get you next year with that one. But uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having me.